Don't go away Please don't go away This is how it's supposed to be Is this how it's supposed to be I'm leaving home for the coastline Someplace under the sun I feel my heart for the first time Cause now I'm moving on, yeah I'm moving on And there's a place that I've dreamed of where I can free my mind I hear the sounds of the season And lose all sense of time I'm moving far away To a sunny place Where it's just you and me Feels like we're in a dream You know what I mean The summer air by the 
in Lansdowne, it was the old Lansdowne, and now here you are in the new Lansdowne. So a very warm welcome uh, to you all, to friends and family and supporters, to those joining us online. We're, we're live streaming uh, today. There are some folks we think as far away as Queensland, Australia, who will be picking up uh, the service. Uh, and together we're here celebrate the life and faith of uh, Ruth Mackay and to thank God for her. We reflected this morning with the family at the crematorium uh, on the verse from the end of Isaiah 40. Uh, there it is on the, on the slide behind me. Uh, if you want to see it live, you can come forward at the end to see the, uh, the, the lovely tribute that the Purdue family have, have done, which captures in stained glass uh, uh, so many of the uh, lovely images of family life that uh, Ruth and Neil and Verity and Rhiannon enjoyed together. There's a, a lovely Bible verse that was the, at the center of our reflections this morning from Isaiah 40. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Just wonderful to under, under, underline scripture above our lives and all that they mean for the Mackays as we know. Uh, Ruth, Neil, Verity, Rhiannon enjoyed family life, sailing, walking, entertaining, and of course, looking after Percy. So, Percy the cat, by the way. Um, we begin uh, with our first hymn this afternoon. We, we take that promise from the scripture uh, of the God who renews the strength of the weak in all the seasons of life, and we turn that scripture into song. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? With, with every breath, the songwriter says, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. That, friends, that is uh, Ruth's experience now in Christ's presence. She stands before the throne of her Savior. We want this service today to create in each of us a longing for that day to be true one day for all of us. We stand to sing, what gift of grace. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
seats. Let's pray together. As we pray, we hear God's word and we take encouragement. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the hope we have in your Son. Thank you that at all times and in all seasons, that hope holds us. Especially when, as now, we find ourselves invaded by grief and sadness, even though mixed with thankfulness. For we loved Ruth, and we miss her, and our lives are the poorer and emptier for her going. So we pray that you will comfort by your spirit, Neil and Verity and Rhiannon, and the wider family, including parents, Alan and Val and Bruce, brother Andrew and Shelley, brother-in-law Keith and Bev, sisters-in-law Hilary and Mike, Julie and Stephen. But as we pray, we are so grateful that Ruth's race is complete. Because of her living hope in Jesus, the resurrection and the life, she has crossed the line and enjoys that inheritance which you have kept for her and for which she has been kept. Thank you that her suffering in all kinds of trials is over and that her lips are repeating, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So Lord Jesus, be with us in this service today by your spirit that we might number our days and live in the light of eternity. We pray all this asking forgiveness for our often too strong love affair with this passing world. In your name we pray it. Amen. Neil was married to Ruth for 36 and a half years. Six months counts, doesn't it, uh, Neil? And he's going to share with us now a personal reflection of and tribute to his wife and the mother of his daughters, Rhiannon and Verity. That's right, take a sip. Okay. Hi there. Well, I didn't realize Ruth was so popular. <laughs> Thank you all for taking the trouble for coming here this afternoon just to, in a small way, celebrate Ruth's life. <clears throat> well, it's hard to know where to begin, how to give a tribute that to some small measure begins to encapsulate our dearest Ruth and what she meant to us. She lived such a full life and influenced and impacted so many people. Ruth was quite a gentle soul who loved life, her family and filled her days sharing her life with others in all sorts of ways. Ruth was born to Alan and Val Morgan on the 15th of April 1960, at home in Christchurch, after what her mum thought was indigestion from eating too many hot cross buns. That may account for Ruth's baking skills. Some of Ruth's earliest memories, spending time with her grandparents, who, lo who, who she loved dearly and conveniently lived next door. They were a close family, and despite living so near, it didn't stop them all going on family camping holidays together. From Christchurch, the family, which now included her brother Andrew, moved to Wimborne, where they spent many years. It was during this time that Ruth had a crush on the Bay City Rollers and could be seen walking around Bournemouth with her best friend Jenny Potter, I think is here somewhere, wearing various items of tartan, as any true fan would, in deference to the band. However, the family were not done with moving, and Ruth is convinced that it was a result of her parents watching too many episodes of the TV sitcom The Good Life that they moved out to a small holding in the village of Anstey in deepest, darkest Dorset. Ruth 
completed sixth form at the QE school in Wimborne, and from there she went to Un Cardiff University, where she did a degree in food technology so she could become a home economics teacher, something she had decided from an early age she wanted to be. Ruth really enjoyed her time at uni and had the opportunity of rowing for the uni team and joining the ski club and learning to ski, which was a sport she loved. At that time, she could be seen driving around Cardiff in her favourite car, a little blue Fiat 500, with the sunroof open and one of the many friends waving at people. You can picture the scene. She spent many happy years getting lost in roads around the south in that little car as her navigation skills were quite legendary. Bad. Um, our worlds overlapped during the summer of 1984 when we met for the first time at Lansdowne Church for the, for the Thursday night Bible study. We were introduced to our lifelong friends, Kathy and Dave Burke, and three years later, Dave married us on the 1st of August, 1987, at the old Lansdowne Church. After our marriage, Ruth continued teaching home economics at Glenmore School for Girls in Bournemouth, where she was soon promoted to head of department. She remained teaching there until we had Verity and Rhiannon, at which point she took on the challenging job of a full-time mum. Richie was absolutely loved, they were precious years. In fact, she told us that the best days of her life were getting married to me and giving birth to our wonderful daughters. When Rhiannon was six, Ruth returned to teaching part-time at Carter Community School in Poole, and later she moved to Ferndown Upper School as head of home economics. After a long and successful career, she took early retirement at the age of 55. What I've said so far is a brief praise of Ruth's life, but she was so much more than this. So how do we go about defining dear Ruth? Ruth, the homemaker. She was a wonderful wife and mother, a real homemaker. We only moved once in our married lives, and that was into the house where we were to spend the next 36 years. Ruth spent those years creating a lovely home and garden. She loved her garden. The hanging baskets she would plant for the summer, we always joked, would rival the hanging gardens of Babylon. She also loved roses and was always thrilled to remind her parents how much better her roses were than theirs. I am sure some of you can recall our yellow rose bush in the middle of the garden, which always produced too many roses to count. The garden she created has become a little oasis of tranquility and colour that we as a family will continue to cherish. Ruth, the cook, the baker, the host. Ruth's early claim to fame was that she was a cook by royal appointment after having cooked carrots for the then Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, whilst at university. Some of us here today have been beneficiaries of her wonderful skills as a cook and baker as she entertained countless people over the years. She loved baking and making cakes for every occasion, weddings, birthdays, and most especially for afternoon teas. She was always just so happy in the kitchen. It was her domain and a love of which I'm pleased to say she has passed on to Verity and Rhiannon. And just as an aside, the girls have produced a printed card of Ruth's famous flapjack recipe, which hopefully you've got in the order of service or you can pick up outside. And it's a very easy recipe to follow. Even I can make it. <laughs> Ruth, the teacher. As mentioned, before teaching, uh, be, mentioned before, teaching was in her DNA. And she just loved encouraging and supporting students as they learnt the life skills of cooking under her tuition. It was not uncommon for us to hear a voice in town shouting out, Hello, Mrs Mackay. Do you remember me? I was a bit naughty in your class, but I really liked your lessons and you taught me how to cook. But it was not only as a teacher school teacher that she was found helping people's cooking skills. Ruth would give advice to friends and family on how to cook, and she has certainly helped me up my game over the last year. Ruth, the sewer. She always had a had sewing or embroidery project on the go, some of which lasted years. She made clothes, especially for the girls early on before it became uncool for them to wear, and enjoyed making some furnishings. I recall Ruth knitting me a jumper when I was dating, which fitted well in the body, but she must have thought I had the arm length of a orangutan. She loved her patchwork quilts for beds and tablecloths for afternoon teas. She completed Verity's tablecloth just recently after starting it 10 years ago, but at least she finished it. Ruth, the volunteer. As a volunteer for the National Trust in Brownsea Island, she became a bit of an authority on the island's history. Even when just visiting the island with us, she would frequently jump into volunteer mode, much to our embarrassment, when island visitors looked at all lost or confused during their visit. She would give them details of island history or places of interest, and importantly, the best places to find were red squirrels. We both helped at Save Families, one of Ruth's nominated charities, which enabled us to come alongside families. 
that, for various reasons, are struggling with life and give them a gentle help and support until they can cope. Helping others was typical Ruth, as it was something that came so naturally to her. It was wonderful to see the change for good she was able to bring into people's lives over the years. Ruth the skier. Ruth loved the mountains and skiing. As a family, we enjoyed wonderful holidays in Austria and Switzerland and Natalie in France. She was always the sensible one on the slopes, counselling discretion over valour. On one occasion, we got split up and we lost Ruth on a run when the visibility suddenly deteriorated. But we were reunited by a Frenchman who had found her alone on the slope. And although my French is poor, he made it very clear that he was not impressed with me having my wife, leaving my wife behind on the slopes. It wasn't as bad as it seemed, but Ruth found it very amusing and didn't really come to my aid and played the damsel in distress. She truly loved the freedom of uh, the mountains, the freshness of the cold air, the diamonds in the sky, the fresh snow glistening in the bluebird day, and being amazed by the beauty of God's creation. And of course, the lovely hot chocolates with a bit of cream on top and chocolate waffles were important too. She also achieved an ambition to be a chalet girl for a season in the French Alps. Well, it was only for four weeks as a chef at one of the Richmond Christian Holiday Chalets. So she combined her love of skiing with cooking. In fact, her cooking was so well received, the following year, some Richmond guests spoke to Ruth to ask her which week she would be there so they could book the same week. Ruth the Sailor. Having learned to sail at the Outward Bounds Activities Centre at Hengersbury Head, little did she know that she was developing a love for the sea, which she would need later when she would meet me. When we started dating, Ruth likened going out to me as doing an assault course. As our days were often involved getting wet, either racing the boat or hiking in the, the Purbex. A bit harsh, but probably some truth in it. She loved being on the water, and throughout our marriage, we were always blessed to have a boat, which we were able to escape on with the family and friends to spend time in Pool Harbour or up in the Solent. It is a love we have passed on to our daughters. Ruth the Welshie. One of Ruth's favourite favorite places to go and spend time was the family cottage in Mid Wales, a place she loved, had grown up visiting since a girl. Spending time over the years at the nearby farms with the farmers and their children, all becoming part of her wider family. When Ruth first introduced me to the cottage, it was a dark, stormy night with lashing rain when we were driving up a very dark, lonely country roads with grass growing up the middle. As previously she mentioned, Ruth's navigation skills are not the strongest of her abilities, and I was becoming a little concerned about whether we were going to get, get there or where we'd end up. However, to her credit, she did eventually find the cottage perched on top of a hill in the driving wind and rain. On entering the cottage, I was introduced to the fact there was no electricity, the lighting was from gas lamps and candles, there was no phone, the heating was from a small wood burner, and the water came from the farmer's water tank in the adjacent field. It was a bit like camping without the luxury. Needless to say, we had many family holidays throughout the years, and we continued this special relationship with the Welsh farmers and Ruth had established and we were, uh, when she was a young girl. Ruth the Traveller. Ruth enjoyed the travelling, especially around Scotland and Wales and Cornwall, but we also travelled around Europe and America and Canada. We have enjoyed many fantastic holidays. We will never forget Ruth's annoying bear bell, which was constantly with her during our Canadian holidays, even in the towns, to ward off any potential grizzly bear attacks. To her credit, it must have worked, because we never even saw one. <laughs> Ruth was also one to avoid getting sunburned, and we still have a wonderful memory of Ruth on the beach in the south of France, Easily spotted, as she's the only one wearing a full set of clothes, head to foot, and under a parasol. Jane Austen would have approved. When on holiday, Ruth was not the best to buddy up with in the airport, as I found out last year in Geneva. Whilst I was busy hunting in my bag for my passport and boarding pass, she left and joined the security line and walked through without me. <laughs> when I eventually got through security, having logged into the airport Wi-Fi to download my boarding pass, she grilled me as to why I hadn't kept up. I explained I'd lost my boarding pass, to which she said, typical only then to put her hand in her pocket, jacket pocket and pull out my boarding pass. <laughs> I think it was still my fault. Ruth the cyclist. Having spent our lives using conventional bikes, we invested in an e-bike for Ruth a couple of years ago, which transformed our cycling. All of a sudden, it was role reversal. A Ruth waiting for me and me not for her. We enjoyed many rides locally and, as, and also in Cornwall and, local, and in North, uh, North Wales. One of our favourite rides was an early morning cycle ride to Sandbanks Beach to sit on a bench and enjoy a coffee and a pastry for Mark Bennett's pastisserie. Well, you have to cycle past the place, didn't you? Ruth the friend. Judging by all the comments on the 
the plus cards we've received and this month and the fact that we've continually had flowers in the house since last February. Ruth was obviously a genuine friend to so many. Gentle and kind, always there with a word of encouragement and support. People just naturally warmed to her company. It was a gift. She had of making people feel wanted and included and people always felt better having been with Ruth. Ruth the mother, the words of Verity and Rhiannon. It's not possible to stream together it's not possible to string together in just a few sentences how beloved our dear mum was. We will treasure forever all our special memories, such as learning how to make delicious jam, helping to create showstopper desserts, going out for a walk, coffee and cake, and relaxing in the garden with a chilled glass of Samuel sweet wine. Life will never be the same. Each day we miss laughing about what we were watching on TV with her, sharing random pictures on WhatsApp of how our day is going, and most of all, her loving hugs and words of encouragement. Ruth, my wife, she just, meant she just meant everything to me, and I miss her so much. Ruth, the child of God. For those who really knew Ruth, her true identity, the things that defined her, was her relationship with her Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Ruth decided to become a Christian at an early age, and her relationship with God grew in faith and love throughout her life. It influenced everything she did, her life, her marriage, her parenting, her friendships, the direction she moved in, everything she, everything she was and did. In fact, Ruth was the first person to be baptised on national TV at the Old Lansdowne Church in 1986. Some of you here will remember that. Her baptism was an act of obedience and witness to her faith in Jesus. And it took great courage reading her testimony and being baptised in front of the nation. The last year has been a truly devastating time for us as a family. We have been broken with Ruth's sudden cancer diagnosis. Ruth had won the fight against cancer 17 years ago and its return was unexpected and sudden. However, despite the hardships over the last year, we have been the recipients of many expressions of outstanding love, care and support from our family and friends. We have been wonderfully encouraged by the many kindnesses and have seen God's hand helping us as we travel the hard, this hard path. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you and that, uh, that we as a family are truly grateful for all the outpouring of love we have received. Throughout her life, Ruth knew she was a loved child of God and that he was walking and guiding every step of her journey. These truths gave her the hope and strength to live through the last year, knowing that her condition was terminal. Indeed, it was his ultimate friendship and relationship with the Lord that has transported dear Ruth from this life into the next and will sustain her throughout eternity. Ruth's identity was and is tied up with Jesus Christ, as is ours, and we as a family shall be reunited with her someday in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Neil, thank you very much for that. It, it's a cliche for sure uh, that a, a picture can paint a thousand words. Well, we've got a few thousand words coming up now. We've got one of those images uh, on the printed order of service uh, that I'm sure you're aware of. It was taken just over a year ago uh, on what was to be Ruth's last ski trip in Maribel, France. You would never know, would you, looking at that picture of alpine health, that a few days later Ruth will be given a diagnosis that would test her Christian faith and that of her family to the limit. So let's use these pictures and the music to reflect on the life of a much-loved wife, daughter, sister, friend, a life lived bravely to the end. I'm pretty sure that, that Ruth would want us to smile as well as be sad as we move through her life. But above all, to thank God for the privilege that she had and we had in knowing her Someone made in God's image and redeemed by his son. Play the video.
Thank you to Rhiannon and Verity and Neil for putting that uh, together. Let's, let's pause for some silence before we sing again as we offer to God in, that, in the silence our own personal thanks for the memories that we have of Ruth, her courage, her humor, her loves and, and her likes. Let's, let's bow and in our hearts thank God as we remember her. Lord, we thank you that, in truth, Ruth walks in fields of gold with the Lord Jesus as Savior. And we here on earth cry, what shall I cry? Cry this, said the voice, all flesh is as grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The psalmist says, those who sowed in tears shall reap with songs of joy. The one on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, may we hear your voice above all the noise of other voices in our lives. Help us to dial down our self-reliance and self-importance, to live with your kingdom, not ours, in mind. And may we make every day you give us in this fragile, fleeting world count. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's sing two songs now. The first is truth to stand on when the storms of life hit. The second, where we go in those storms, in Christ alone, and hide me now. Thanks, Ali.
mentioned uh, Dave and Kath, Kathy Burke being with us today. We're delighted to have you here. Please come and uh, pray and then uh, read the Bible passage to us. I didn't realize until this morning that Dave baptized Ruth on national TV. Um, and it's great to have you here. Bless you. Thank you, Peter. Some of us pray a lot, love to pray. Others of us only pray when we're in serious trouble. And that's okay. Some of us don't pray at all. I'm not quite sure what's going on. But I'd like us all, if you would, just to join our hearts. And if you can, say amen. And if for you prayer is not a thing, then maybe this could be a reflection um, that might point you in a direction that I think Ruth would love you to head in. 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Father, thank you that these words written three millennia ago are gloriously and wonderfully true for Ruth now. Thank you that her youth is renewed like the eagles. Her sins are forgiven. She's completely healed and enjoys a life that we can scarcely imagine. And Ruth was a gift to us. And for her, we're really grateful. Thank you that she was a gift to Alan and Val, their daughter. And we pray for them now in the ache of losing her. And we pray that you'll help them to grieve and help them to heal and bless them. And Ruth was a gift to Andrew and to Shelley. And we just heard what that means to Andrew this morning at the barn. And we pray for him and ask that you might help him to grieve and to heal. And Lord, we pray to for for Neil, a Ruth was a gift to him and he to her. I cannot imagine what it would be like to lose Kathy. I pray for my brother help and help him to heal. And please look after him. And Ruth was a, a wonderful gift to Verity and Rhiannon. And these two friends of ours are precious to us. And we pray that you will be alongside them all the days of their life. Help them to treasure their mum. Help them to cry, but not to grieve as the world does. Because we have this amazing hope in the gospel. Lord, Kathy and I want to thank you that Ruth was a gift to us. We met her in Edge Hill Road when we moved into the flat above her. We got to know her uh, so well in those years. We met Alan and Val in the garden at the back of the house and then introduced him to Neil and had the privilege of being part of her baptism and wedding and seeing the girls born and growing up together and being friends for virtually the whole of our married lives together. And Father, we miss her, and it's hurt us to lose her. And all of us in this room are here because it's hurt us to lose her. Father, we're human, and that means we hurt. We don't know why you've taken her, in the way that you did, in the time that you did. But Father, as somebody who has learned how to trust you, even when the evidence is against it, I trust you. And know that your timing is right and your ways are perfect. All of us in this room are human. And our lives are short. And the very first breath we take is one of the last we will ever take. Thank you for the truth of that word that says, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs everything else. Father, we pray that this trouble will achieve for you and for us, glory, 
that we'll find that this loss does us all in many different ways good. And it brings honour and glory most of all to you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and thank you for the gift of Ruth to us. Amen. So I'm guessing that maybe Ruth wanted me to read today. Um, thanks, Ruth, for a really hard job. <laughs> um, so I'm wearing a scarf with all her favourite colours to keep me company. <laughs> I'm actually going to read the reading that Neil asked me to read in reverse order. So sorry, Dave Smith, for that. I was always trouble. I'm still trouble. Um, but we're going to read from 2 Corinthians, and we're starting in chapter 5, verse 1, and then we'll go back to chapter 4. And verse 16, hopefully you'll see why I'm reading it this way. Um, because it's headed in chapter 5, awaiting the new body. Ruth isn't awaiting her new body. She's got it now. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Dave. Back to front or upside down, that's a great reading. So, Ruth, um, Tanya Mackay, or Morgan, as she was born. You see, as they say, you can take the girl out of Wales, but you can't take Wales out of the girl. And I'm glad about that. It's a fact that I only really got to know Ruth properly in the last year of her life. I'd seen her, of course, at f previous family occasions, and we'd done the small talk thing. But when someone has a cancer diagnosis and is given a few months to live, you don't talk the small stuff. That doesn't really matter. Not that Ruth was only serious and spiritual. I, I found her, I don't know about, about you guys, I found her wonderfully free of evangelical jargon. She thought deeply about her faith. And she found ways of expressing it that were unique to her. She also had a great sense of humor, as I was telling the family this morning. And I think I've told the congregation in Lansdowne on a Sunday recently. It lived in, 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 in my memory a long time, the time, the occasion she told me to up my game when I visited her for what proved to be the last time, the week before she died. You see, I'd forgotten to bring chocolates and a Bible, so I used uh, a family Bible from a nearby bookshelf. And as I leant across the bed to apologize for being such a poor example of a minister of the gospel, she said loud enough for everyone in the room to hear, you'd better up your game next time. And then there was Percy. I was introduced to Sir Percy the Cat on my first official visit to 8 Rowland Avenue. Percy prowled 
and scowled and reluctantly, I think, meowed. Percy, this is Peter, said uh, Ruth. Peter, say hello to Percy. Now listen, talking to cats is not really my thing. But I did, rather lamely. It was Ruth and Neil I'd come to talk to, not Percy. But Percy had to have his milk before Peter had his coffee. So I waited and watched as Percy was served first. I could swear he glanced over at me with a look of feline triumph. (laughs) I'd called in that day to see Neil and Ruth because they were reconnecting with Lansdowne as, as a church and as members to discuss the sorts of ways that they could get involved using their gifts. You remember, Neil? Uh, in the life of of Lansdowne, uh, as we were then, as we are now, at a a new strategic and exciting stage of our development. Neil had retired, he'd got himself a new boat, and they were looking forward to their adventures together in the boat and in the church. They talked enthusiastically and positively about what lay ahead. Looking back now, there was, of course, something deeply poignant about that conversation. You know, all of us make our lists in life, don't we? We draw up our plans, never knowing what tomorrow might bring. So much of that agenda for Ruth was never to be fulfilled, of course. And it's a matter, frankly, of sadness to me in many ways. But God had other plans, if that isn't a cliche. So let me say this to make it real and not a cliche. Sometimes God's plans are really difficult to understand. They leave us asking questions, don't they? And one of the many things that Ruth's extraordinary life has taught me is that we learn sometimes painfully that we are never really in control. Have you got that, guys, yet? We're never really in control. We like to think we are. Everything around us in society tells us that we are or that we need to be, take control, be in charge of your own destiny. People know it's not true, really. We set our targets, we, um, we map out our career path, and then something happens, something unexpected, something over which we have no control, and bang, the walls collapse, and the calendar has to be torn up. You could be skiing on French snow slopes one day, and the following week you can be undergoing a scan which reveals a fast-growing tumor. We're not in control. Of course, some people faced with the uncertainty and the fragility of life like that grab hold of life even tighter because it's all they've got and all they think there is. Because if this world of ours is all there is, then hey, make sure you fulfill as much of your bucket list as possible. If, like the philosopher-scientist Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all there is, or was, or ever will be, that makes sense. But not if there is more to life than this. And for most people today, I would argue, and for most people throughout history, the fear is not that there is nothing after death, but that there is something. We wonder, don't we, what that far country might look like. But it's not just a fear of the unknown world, but also a hope that there is one which drives us to dream. We long for a world that that makes ultimate sense of the injustice, of the suffering, of the pain, of the disappointments, of our brief existence. We recognize that, 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 that at one level, all we are is, is, is just, just two numbers, either side of a hyphen on a tombstone, 15th of April, 1960, dash 2nd of February, 2024. That's all. But at another level, 
We know ourselves to be so much more than that. Dust we may be, but we are dust that dreams. And it is this two-dimensional awareness which is being explored in our reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 4. So let me just reflect for a little with you on that. Paul begins that paragraph at verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. And he goes on to give us four reasons why we don't need to lose heart. Reason number one, we are being inwardly renewed, is what he says. We do not lose heart, because though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You see, there is the two-dimensional reality in which we all live. Outwardly wasting away, inwardly we're upping our game, becoming stronger. Outwardly wasting away, though. The person who is being renewed on the inside still lives with sickness and suffering. They are not immune to, to cancer, to rheumatism, to depression, to pressure, to stress. We grow old and die like everyone else. Just because we believe in, in the second dimension doesn't mean we get a free pass. Our memories fade. We are susceptible to viruses, infections, backache. The bladder weakens. We develop wrinkles. Outwardly, yeah, outwardly, we're all wasting away. But there's another reality, you see, which offsets that. The other dimension. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. You see, that is the other dimension in which this person who does not lose heart actually lives. <laughs> I may be outwardly cracking up, but inwardly... I'm waking up. I'm being renewed. Reason number two, we don't lose heart because we have a different perspective on our troubles. Says Paul in verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You see, what we do living in this two dimensions of reality, we, we compare, we weigh up the earthly life, the one single dimension, alongside that other inner renewed life dimension. And here's what happens. In the one scale, we put our troubles, and they seem light, momentary, in comparison to the weight of eternal glory that is found in the other dimension, in the other scale, the permanent dimension. Now, Paul, when he says light troubles, doesn't mean that they only last a minute. He means they only last this present lifetime. That's why they're light and momentary. And that is nothing compared to the forever dimension of the future. Here comes the third reason why we do not need to lose heart. Verse 18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's why we don't lose heart, because we fix our eyes on the unseen, which sounds upside down, but the person who lives in both dimensions is able to look at what he can't see and regard it as far more important, far more real than what he can see. Because for this person, what happens after they die is, is more substantial, more significant, more lasting than what happens before they die. Just think about it. One-dimensional living is pretty desperate. Because if you think that this life is all there is, then you will do everything you can to hold on to it and make the most of it. You'll be driven by the need to stay young, fit, and healthy. You'll invest all you've got in material things. You'll do all in your power to be happy. You will be happy when you get good grades. You'll be happy when you go to university. You'll be happy when you get to the right university. You'll be happy when you get a job. You'll be happy when you get a pay rise. You'll be happy when you get a promotion. You'll be happy when you can work for yourself. You'll be happy when you're rich. You'll be happy when you are the owner of an olive grove in Sardinia. 
You'll be happy when you are in a relationship. You'll be happy when you get married. You'll be happy when you have children. You'll be happy when, you, when your children are exactly the kind of children you want them to be. You'll be happy when you leave home. You'll be happy when you buy a house. You'll be happy when you pay off the mortgage. You'll be happy when you have a bigger garden in the countryside and nice neighbors who invite you to barbecues on a Saturday. Get the picture? That is what one-dimensional life looks like. But if, all, if that's all you've got, then you will lose heart. But the person who lives with and for that other dimension won't. The fourth reason is there in the opening paragraph of, of chapter 5. We don't lose heart because we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Here's what Paul says. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... If all that material happiness that we built up over the generations in the end is destroyed, as it will be, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by, by human hands. You see, the problem with living in only one dimension is the problem of the earthly physical tent. If all we've got is an earthly body, then we, we are sure to be made homeless at some point, for that tent will inevitably wear out and eventually collapse. But the person living and dying in the other dimension has an attractive relocation package already lined up. And as we get older, we can't wait to get out of this crumbling tent and into our five-star built by God to last forever home. In the words of verse 2, we groan. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So death does not rob the person living in this renewed permanent dimension of the future. It actually brings them into that dimension completely. That's why in one sense, we can't wait to be dead in order to be alive in this heavenly eternal dimension. I quoted uh, this morning in the barn a bit of the evangelist D.L. Moody's observation Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. But this is how Moody's quote continues. For Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Therefore, I shall have gone up higher. That is all. Gone out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body like unto his own glorious body. You see, there's the fifth reason why we do not lose heart. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. That's why we don't lose heart. Now, Paul has made that point, actually, in the paragraph just before the one where we began, verse 14, where he says this, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. That's why we don't lose heart, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That's why we believe that though we're outwardly wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. That's the reason why we have a different perspective on our light and momentary troubles. That's why we fix our eyes on what we can't see. That's why we have an eternal house in heaven, because we have a risen Savior who will take us home to a brave new world one day. My friends, if Jesus has not conquered death and pioneered a way through death, for us to life beyond death, then this, all of this, is pie in the sky. If Jesus is not the resurrection and the life, then this world is all there is, and we might as well do all we can to stay around for as long as possible with our gym subscriptions and our anti-aging cosmetics and our macrobiotic diets. If this is all there is, if there is no life beyond this, if what is unseen doesn't exist, 
then all we've got to look forward to is to filling our diaries with busyness and leisure in the hope of silencing that nagging question, what's the point of it all? If it all goes back in the box at the end of the day, what's the purpose of the game of life? Outwardly wasting away, but inwardly we, be, we are being renewed day by day. How, how's that possible? The death-defeating, game-changing, grave-emptying resurrection of Jesus. That's how. An event in history with global implications. For what happened to Jesus will happen to those who trust in Jesus. So bring it on, says Paul. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. And that resurrection life of Jesus doesn't just make life after death absolutely certain for the Christian. It makes life before death utterly different too. The resurrection of Jesus changes not just how we die, but how we live. And that means, that means folks, that growing old is not really a problem. Getting cancer is not ultimately a problem. Not really. Not finally. We're not scared of the clock ticking or the sands of time running through the hourglass of life, because the Spirit of God in us points us away from difficulties to that day. As I finish, let's be clear about this. <laughs> that resurrection life of Jesus that lives in you by faith in Him now, that resurrection life won't right now take away your arthritis or your bald patch. It won't stop you getting dementia or needing chemotherapy, nor will it prevent the day when your heart stops beating. But if you are a believer in Jesus, it will give you a different perspective on all of that. Those things won't ultimately define you. You'll know deep down that all of those things in the end are really not worth bothering about. The person who believes in Jesus fixes his eyes on what he can't see. The person who doesn't can only see in one dimension. But listen and look. The tomb is empty. Death has been defeated. Therefore, we don't need to invest in this life as if it were the only life. Let it go. So here's a question. Are we one or two-dimensional people? There's a brilliant quote that someone sent me the other day, and I want to finish with it. It goes like this. For those not in Christ, this life is the best it will ever get. For those in Christ, this life is the worst it will ever get. Things can only, in that pop song, can only get better. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Well, let's think about that, shall we? as we sing together our final hymn. Answer for yourself the question which this song asks in its opening line. What is our hope in life and death? Answer the question as we stand to sing the song.
Let's remain standing for a final prayer. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Lord, may the truth of the resurrection of Jesus mean that we live two-dimensional lives so that though outwardly we are all of us wasting away, inwardly by faith in you, we are being renewed until that day when we see you face to face as our dear sister Ruth does. Thank you for hope that springs eternal. Christ, our hope in life and death. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And may we trust Christ and Christ alone. For he lives. He lives. And everlasting life is in him and with him forevermore. So may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Please sit down, friends. And uh, as we meet uh, Neil and Rhiannon and Verity over tea and coffee, let me say that we've got two rooms laid out. The same food in each room. You don't get better f food in this room from that room. If you want gluten-free, please ask. We have an amazing kitchen staff here. They have gluten-free options if you want that. Teas and coffees, plenty to eat, lots of good things. Uh, we have a great catering team. We're catering for 150 we're looking forward to catering for 300 people at the church lunch on Sunday. So this is a kind of practice for 300 people being given something to eat and drink. It's been good to be with you. I know the family want to thank, uh, thank you for being here, supporting them. Uh, let's encourage them and each other as we trust Christ, our hope in life and death. May God bless you. You